Welcome to Coming Down to Earth, a Conflict Transformation Online Summit to explore pathways towards regenerative cultures in a divided world. My name is Nuno da Silva. I'm here today with my colleague Eva Schoenveld, who is also host for this summit. Hi, Eva. And the two of us are sitting in different parts of the world. I'm in the south of Portugal. Eva is in uh, Scotland, and we are with Manish Srivastava. I, it's, it, I'm, I'm, I know it's not the right way to pronounce it, but I'm doing my best. Welcome, Manish, uh, who is talking to us from Pune, India. Manish, you have, I mean, I'm so happy to, to be here with you today and have the chance to get to know a bit more of your work. You, have, you are a coach, a facilitator, you are an incredible artist, and you've been working with leaders across business, government, UN agencies, NGO sector, to try to solve really complex sustainability challenges. And I mean, you had a work, a life before that, working with uh, uh, the private sector, and uh, more recently, you became a senior practitioner with the Presencing Institute. You are a master facilitator in theory, you uh, based system systemic transformation processes, and you are a teacher of social presencing theater. And I haven't had the chance to read your book yet, but you wrote a book, I think last year, called Trading Armor for a Flower, where you explore through poetry um, the different understandings and experiences of the masculine and the feminine. And so I'm so pleased to, to welcome you to this, uh, to this space. Thank you, welcome. Nuno. Thank you, Nuno. I'm very happy to be here. And thank you, Eva. Uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation. This so great... you have, you have a, a, an amazing life journey. It would be hard to, 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 to describe it in, in few words. So I think maybe the, a good starting point would be um, to invite you to share a bit of your understanding of conflict uh, that led you to certain to work with with certain practices to approach conflict situations and tensions um, through your life experience. What 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 like in what ways you got you gain insights into what other ways we could start to understand and relate to conflict? That's a great question, Nuno. And uh, uh, I, as, I, as I think about my life journey, um, for a long period of my life, I was uh, either avoiding conflicts <laughs> or really getting worked up uh, with conflicts. Uh, and uh, that's been the ping pong that I played all my life. And it's only uh, recently, um, in last decade or so, I uh, started uh, looking deeply into what it means. And, and all my work, uh, and in fact, I feel that everyone's work, a human life, if you are living, we are engaging with conflicts and we are developing strategies, tools and practices to transform them. Uh, conflict arises the moment you wake up. Your body longs to do something and mind has other plans. So there is an inner conflict. And then you want to talk to your family and there, you want to eat something that's not available. So there is a social conflict. And you want to go in the sun, but there is rain. So there is ecological conflict. And then there are conflicts related to identities, races, uh, all of that. So I started noticing that in my life and all my work, uh, particularly the work uh, which is about contemplative social art is about how to bring a group of stakeholders into a room to attend to their divides, to attend to where they are not in sync and to explore what is the beauty uh, within that crack. So in other words, it's healing. It's collective healing, systems healing, relational healing. And that's the uh, deeper purpose of a conflict. Uh, I just also want to, uh, because you asked me how my understanding evolved, uh, I, when I look now, I see that 
there is a social technical dimension of any conflict be it a relation organizational or societal but within it uh, there is a spiritual dimension and how we address the conflict depends on what is the mindset or approach we have towards conflict if it is avoidance like i had earlier then i don't have to do anything i can just keep compromising in my life but that's not the way to live life so some day we speak and then comes the question am i addressing the technical social dimension that requires legal dialogic kind of solutions negotiations or when we look within the spiritual dimension where the question comes that all conflicts are actually inner conflicts that's the wisdom from i ching or as ramana maharishi the great saint from india says uh, somebody asked him this question how do you deal with others and his reply was there is no other and that's a deep reflection that when we look at conflict if there is no other then in the spiritual dimension then conflict becomes an opportunity for us to take the inner journey to integrate the other to expand our sense of identity i go beyond being a hindu a indian um a north indian a man and i start paying attention to how uh, this person or these people i am conflicted with are a manifestation of my own inner conflict and what integration i need to do within and outside to expand and then the conflict becomes a aha oh wow there is another conflict let's look at it what i need to integrate what i need to expand wow that's i was hearing you and and it it just came to me like if we if we don't uh, look into conflict in that open way we actually re- don't really meet each other and in a way we also don't meet ourselves it's like yeah in a way I, it recalled me a, a sentence of a friend of mine, uh, Bio Kumolafi, who is also one of the inter, uh, guest speakers of the summit, who says, "Like your your soul is strange; you haven't met it yet," which is a bit like I think touching on on what you're saying that actually this sense of expansion as we open ourselves to to these moments that are great opportunities to to expand our understanding of who we are and and how much more we can be. So perhaps you can you you mentioned a contemplative um, social uh, art social art and perhaps you can tell tell us a bit more about that like what that the those, what are those practices that you think are are really key to approach conflict in in this more generative way uh, this uh, contemplative social art is um is i think a emerging field and i'm kind of uh, making this name along with others uh, where it is coming from is that if we want to access that deeper dimension of a conflict uh, and we have that readiness to explore that this every conflict is an invitation of the soul to integrate and belong when we start from that premise uh, then we need tools that will help us to actually explore that and those tools those practices are not necessarily available in the uh, in the technical social dialogic dimension alone there we need uh, a process to look within and that's the contemplative dimension look within like uh, jung carl jung has this famous quote uh, how is this my creation and my other teacher peter sengis says you cannot solve a problem unless you see your thumbprint in it and i interpret it unless you see your role in creating a challenge you are a victim victim has a great unconscious power position but victims can't solve problems but once we see that i have a creation conscious or unconscious and this is an invitation then i move into a powerful position if i can create this conflict i can also resolve this conflict and that's there is agency in that so how do we create that reflective platform it it doesn't happen just by analytical uh, understanding it requires a embodied wisdom 
And for that embodied wisdom, uh, there are different practices. Uh, and I, I have I use some of the practices, and one of the practices called social presencing theater, uh, which has been uh, developed by Arvana Hayashi at Presencing Institute, who is my teacher. Uh, and I have started blending social presencing theater with uh, with visual art, uh, drawing what what I have experienced, and poetry, because poetry is an embodied song. Poetry, in its essence, is a direct felt perception of my body, of my senses, and it marries with the mythical and metaphorical uh, language and brings out uh, something which is beautiful. So we use these. Uh, modalities, different methods. Uh, and I would say anyone who uses all of these methods uh, with a community, when people are able to, sometimes it's difficult to say what's really wrong because there is power, privilege, rank in the room. People have voice, but they don't have say. So a lot gets edited when we just do the dialogic process, which was first, first part of my career. <laughs> we were doing a lot of dialogic process and I was coming back happy. But later I realized and my mentors helped me see that people who spoke are the people who had the say anyways. And there were little hiccups and little lowering of the body, which had a lot to be said, which I didn't capture. So how do you make visible that underlying dimension of the field without judgment. And that's where the art comes. Art has no agenda except to make visible. Because if art has an agenda, and I'm now going to other <laughs> teacher of mine, um, Joseph Campbell. I didn't meet him, but I learned from him. He says, if art has an agenda, it's propaganda. <laughs> or pro pornography. <laughs> you know, it is either taking you somewhere or pushing you somewhere. But in between is a pure art, which is, which is just expressing. Uh, and so if people get an opportunity to draw their feelings or to make a shape about what they're feeling in some way, that expresses a lot. And imagine if a group of people can do that together, that brings out a lot more, which was not available. And if contemplation can allow you to hold all of that, all those colors, differences, emotions into one whole, you have a mandala. You have a sense of wholeness and that's healing. Trust me, that's truly healing. Yeah, I was, I was thinking like, I remember hearing, I think it was Stephen Jenkinson saying that art, uh, is is not uh, mindful of consequences. Is not concerned about consequences. You just like you channel something that needs to be expressed in a certain way, uh, without being concerned like what is going to happen with with that because it's just like a, a spontaneous expression of of a part of the whole in a way. Yeah. So that's yeah. That's that's amazing. Perhaps you can talk us a bit about like some of some of practical experiences you had in this where you could see the benefits of such kind of practice in in uh, the way conflict unfolded in a different with with more possibilities or with in a different way from what is usual where there's a lot of fight or flee kind of of approaches so i actually have uh, as i talk to you, I have a few examples coming to my mind. Um, and uh, one is about the relational dimension where conflicts are. And that also inspired uh, writing of this book, Trading Armor for a Flower. And the other ones are from the organizational and societal dimension. So maybe I'll, uh, I'll share one by one and you can, you can help me to, to ground it into, into the um, understanding of the, of, of the conference itself. <laughs> Excuse me. So the first um, one is um, in 2018, a Me Too movement uh, caught fire in India. And there were so many uh, cases of that. And around that time, uh, both me and my wife were part of, uh, I was part of men's circles, gathering men 
uh, around uh, this uh, poetry and mythology kind of we initiated mythopoetic movement in india uh, and on the other side my wife was also involved in women empowerment circles and i was also working uh, for women empowerment with village women so somewhere we got invited by a group of people an organization uh, who had uh, who had fired three of their directors uh, on acquisition of me too but that happened but the after impact of that was that men and women were finding it very difficult to talk to each other after that and they thought that the organization is going through a breakdown uh, so the whole field was kind of broken and they invited us to uh, to facilitate a dialogue and I, i remember as i entered the room and heard their check in there were only two dominant emotions women were angry on behalf of all women kind almost and men felt very ashamed on behalf of all mankind and with these two emotions i could not see a possibility to have a dialogue anything you say that's the uh that's the code it has to go through that code and at some stage i said okay let's stop that uh let's get into groups and instead of telling me about how you are feeling in this moment why don't you show me so if you are feeling suppressed you create a body sculpture of that if you are feeling ashamed you create a body sculpture of that whatever you feeling and invite other people to make different shapes without telling so if you have somebody who is pressurizing you or accusing you or making your life miserable give them a force make them a force give them a shape so it kind of created a little tableau of uh, of the social sculpture without talking this practice is called stuck in social presencing theater anyways the point is that once we completed that process and sat down i asked them again uh, how do you feel now and as we asked this question there was an interesting insight insight was that like some of the women said the anger that i am having is not mine and men were neither the shame is mine so where is it coming from and we realized that there is a collective narrative so who is at conflict it's the role the structure the history the identity my own past experiences those are the armors that i wear and they are at conflict but the one inside the embodied experience is not necessarily in conflict maybe for somebody it is maybe somebody directly experienced uh, uh something at workplace yesterday and that's in their body but as we go into the contemplating uh, contemplative awareness uh there is maybe the body has something else to tell about it and maybe it has to tell about that in intensity that's okay too so i realize that maybe uh, there is more to more to this at that moment i started compiling all the uh, poetry that was coming from my embodied experience and uh, and weaving it into uh into this book called trading uh, armor for a flower uh and uh, and i think uh, so that's one insight no no that uh the healing happened when people connected with their own bodies and allow it to move so it's not just i remain like this if i am suppressed i just allow that shape to move wherever the body wants to take and and i moved to a new shape and that allows me to generate embodied wisdom generative wisdom about if i am in this conflict what is the truly felt experience and where does it really want to go not the mind mind may seek uh, something else but where the body wants to go and that gives insights to people and gives agency to them to articulate what they experienced i've been using that in many uh, we did many dialogue circles around around this feminine and masculine uh, and men and women uh, conflicts and this was a similar experience everywhere else uh, and nothing is edited you 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 receive whatever comes 
but the fact that it got embodied and expressed if it is not embodied all men are like that show me how all men are like or all women are like that feminist are like that but when you drop those structures and stories and get to your own felt experience a socially felt experience not just individual the whole collective does that it it creates new information new compassion a new way forward i hope i'm i was able to explain that <clears throat> it's really interesting and I, and i wanted to 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 hear a little bit more about um you know that that first group that you were telling us about and and how what people's reflections were on how things had shifted in the you know before and after the yeah uh, yeah thank the, you the exercise within their within their their relationships between one another and within the organization what what shifted was uh, first of all in the room itself um when we embodied our uh, our current situations and emotions and felt experience and gave um shapes to other forces which we considered as oppress oppressors or oppressed you know that's the basic dynamic of a of of a, uh and there are witnesses and helplessness and all of that so when we did that and when we and each one is spoke from their shape uh you suddenly got in touch with that oppressor was also oppressed you know because oppressor doesn't know the story we drop the story <laughs> oppressor is pre- uh, pressurizing and an oppressor says it's so tiring to make you go up and then you realize oh i thought that this guy was not helping me but he himself is oppressed so there was a new um, a kind of a new understanding that uh both men and women were oppressed and oppressing each other uh because i think i can say 95% uh, of the people in the room didn't have that experience what they were carrying on behalf of the collective so in my in one of the poem which came out of that is that why do we bring a lifetime of conflicts into our bedrooms right like a prized possession possession so that's what we end up doing um and that was one realization the second was a uh, very specific um men uh, got in touch that just by being ashamed they are not helping anyone if they connect with their own masculinity and they have anger then they should stand up for that and and see what they want to do some men responded they actually want to reach out to those who are accused and understand but they were dis- feeling disempowered because the moment they say they want to do that women's anger are oh you too mm-hmm. and they, that voice that's uh, that's actually one of the key inspiration because that's the voice of masculine that often doesn't get honored in that conflicted situation we need that masculine energy to stand up and say i want to listen and i want to go ahead and talk but that was being suppressed so they, so some of the people who in men actually created those conversations because not that accused was completely bad actually one of the accused uh, came to a later embodied poetry uh, circle and he shared that he was not guilty and he had to go he was fired he went through that whole process and embodiment helped him to to create resilience within him and feel that the one who is accusing he could see in their sculpture the one who is accusing is suffering not by him but by the collective and he could take the responsibility of that in a different way so when he uh, he was acquitted from all that all those charges uh interesting uh, that his own people women in his house uh, said that let's go back and uh, and file a charge and he said no because uh, maybe i was not guilty but as a collective patriarchy has gone wrong somewhere and so i don't want to just uh, keep playing this game what he did was is the title he traded his armor for a flower he says no more fighting please i can stand as a man and receive this blow 
you know. So wow. that, th- these are some, uh, and I discovered this after a year. Uh, in another circle, he showed up, and and the other friend told me he was the one who went through. He was the other side. But you know, in theater, in in contemplation, in embodiment, you meet the other and discover that other is a part of you. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it, when when this big rape incident in India happened, I don't know why I cried. I cried for the women. I also cried for the uh, for the men in the situation, and uh, and it took me time to understand that it activated a raw nerve of repressed sexuality within me, and I got fearful about my own body. Poetry and embodiment and this contemplative art gave me a way to explore and bring it into a poetry, and when I read that poem, it activates the raw nerve <laughs> in others. Somehow, uh, it does, and then it creates. It opens opens a conversation. Um, and sometimes, when conversation is difficult, I say, "No problem. Just just show me a shape. Show me a drawing." And we don't need to process it fully. <laughs> we it trust. Sounds like, yeah, it sounds it sounds really magical in in that it, in putting some of the stuff that's inside outside into the world. Yeah. But in a in a kind of embodied way, um, embodied. There, there's some something um, really new and fresh gets seen, um, and, and can be kind of agreed on by people who 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 intellectually might might not agree. Yeah, but there's something about that real complexity of who we all are and the, all the different parts of us that gets seen mm-hmm. in that way. Yeah, it's uh, I, I, one of the things I was going to say that is totally related with that, Eva, is is that the body doesn't lie, or let's say it's harder for the body to lie, and it has it it is in touch with things that we are not aware of. So I was thinking when when you tell me Manish about the history of of the role of of man and woman in India, and I can see that also perf- rolling out in in my culture. There's a lot of that past still present but that most of the times we are not aware or we ignore or just say that the past is the past and actually those uh, yeah the, the the past history is still present in inside of us deeply in in our bodies and in, and then shapes how we we show up and so thank you for that and i wonder like that's so you you brought a, a case of a very concrete example on a relational level and and you you told us you had another example that is more on organizational yeah uh, sure and i think uh, this is uh, this is also i am so grateful to uh, to all these experiences because they taught me uh, how to accept uh, conflict uh, as a gift that is a complete transformation uh, you and if you had met me 10 years back uh, there was a different me so this experience is about a uh, uh, few organizations working in the field of anti trafficking uh, and these are uh, the funding organizations were from japan uh, the grassroots organizations from india and uh, they had um, at least a 5 to 6 year old conflict among them uh but uh, if you see it's a, it's a, it's a time old conflict uh which brings into very practical aspect when they are working with when they are rescuing the women uh from prostitutions and they come across a prostitute actually being a pimp and uh putting girls into prostitution you come across a ethical dilemma is she a culprit who is promoting uh, this uh, crime or is she uh, she has gone through that suffering and stuck in the system and being used by others so this uh, just give you one example but there were many such nodes of conflict among these very passionate people uh, and they wanted to uh, to explore because this has this would often bring them to this point where they could not move further in spite of their passion and resources so they said that let's do a a workshop where you can help resolve the conflict and use some of your methodologies uh and we were together now uh 
cutting the long story short, the beauty was that it's an important part I have realized. Invite people across, not just people on the top who uh, who talk about what is the challenge, but also people who experience the grassroots people, men, women, uh, different uh, nationalities, cultures. So I uh, we created a microcosm, uh, not a very large group, but small microcosm. And we started doing these practices. We, the, we spent days with meditation and movement. And on the, on the uh, afternoon uh, of the second day, some of them got restless. Now, mind you, they are lawyers. They are uh, mediators. Uh, they are negotiation experts in the room. And one of them took me to the corner and said, are you going to address our conflict or go around it? And part of me was saying, oh my God, am I avoiding, <laughs> avoiding it again? But I said, you know, you are a negotiator. You tell me, how would you do that? She was like, we have tried, it didn't work. So I said, then allow me to use a method. And I asked them that, don't tell me what you're experiencing, but show me. You choose roles. You choose your roles, others' roles, and the community roles. And put a, put a kind of a role on your, on your chest and then make shapes and stay in that shape. Tune into that shape. If you're feeling stretched and feel it and stay with that and you create a social sculpture of what is uh, your felt current reality. And each organization created their uh, felt sculpture. Uh, this is also a part of social presencing theater, but I improvised for the, for the moment. And what came out, um, I'll just tell you one example was that uh, they were showing the conflict like this, that the, the two people are fighting. So imagine uh, Nuno is also doing and I'm doing this. It was like this. Yeah, like that. What others saw was that they are actually collaborating and offering something from divine. What they saw that they, they were fighting. Now that alone creates a new information. That's the step one of a conflict resolution, that there is a new dis- uh, confirming information, which means my reality is not the only reality. There is another reality and my mind opens. But when we go deeper and speak about the felt experience of the people, our heart opens. And when we really surrender to the field, then uh, the soul opens. And after doing this activity, uh, we actually embodied the... Um, the uh, woman who uh, is sold to prostitution, a young girl, we embodied that whole situation. People got into different roles and played that. Uh, there was a breakdown in the room. Um, we got in touch with our helplessness. And what came out that in, in the process of bringing justice, what was missing was dignity. Not just for the, for the women, uh, who is going through this uh, process, but also rest of the system, for the police officer, for them, uh, the people who were in the room. And there was one interesting dialogue that one woman said in the end, because on the third day, one of them suddenly asked me, so are we going to talk about the conflict? And I said, do you still feel that conflict in your body? She tried it. And she, she tried and she said, no, my body is not feeling it. So I said, what happened? I was curious. I didn't know. I said, what happened? And she answered, while my mind is longing for a resolution, my body has already found its dissolution. And that's actually another poem uh, that was inspired in the moment that our mind is seeking a resolution, an apology, a sorry, but body has an experience of dissolution. The conflict is no more relevant between them. They have got in touch with the essence, which is bringing dignity to the women. And it's okay if some of the problems are not resolved. They can meet at the source. They may not be able to meet at the structural uh, complexity. But at the source, they know that what the women whom they are rescuing seeks is dignity and the women who they are finding as culprit also longs for dignity. And maybe there is another way to get to dignity. And that led to two or three amazing prototypes. 
in fact the result was amazing even the conflict between them was uh, they still they found a ground to talk the conflict shows up again and again in different ways in different conflict show up but now you know they connect at a very different level and i have gathered that data and mapped it actually the frequency of their meeting the quality of the way they come together the projects they are involved in uh, the way, the amount of uh, resources deployed towards uh, dignity towards bringing dignity to uh, to to them including the title changed from anti trafficking to pro dignity uh, because they realized that by anti trafficking we actually the topic itself has a conflict built in but if we say pro dignity then then everyone agrees there completely so that's uh, uh, another kind of organizational example uh, which where this kind of work um, by we used all these methods uh, i told you uh, all the contemplative art method allowed us to speak about the unspoken in the room it helped us to connect with um, those aspects of the system which were our blind spots and when we connect and bring those voices in uh, there is the system starts becoming whole and that's healing a root word for healing and wholeness is same right so when you start connecting to this unspoken voice of uh, of the victim of the prosecutor of the family then somewhere the system starts holding it together and the healing starts and the body knows that healing is happening mind may still get stuck into a ego trip mm. yeah i'm curious to see how what's emerging for you Eva, but I, i i was thinking and i was thinking like how much our ideas of justice can can come in the way of transformation is one of the things that came from this story that's amazing and the other is how how often we get trapped in avoidance in kind of trying to go away from things that because we grow up you know in our system working with that and and actually not moving towards what what we believe and what is more valuable in this case like moving away from you know being anti something that we know is bad and that makes a lot of pain and moving towards something that is life affirming such as dignity so where there's much more vitality in that space so that's really interesting to to just notice that from the story thank you so much mm. yeah i was i'm fascinated to know how the how the contemplative part comes into that because it feels like um you know i'm i have have been involved in 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 sort of constellation type uh processes which are similar to to what you're talking about but it's it, it, it's really incorporated that kind of more uh contemplative mode um and so i would love to hear more about how you bring that in and what you feel it it kind of adds to the adds to that process because i'm sensing that you go very deep and i i'm guessing that that's that's part of what brings that that's a great question and i think that's the differentiator to many of the expressive art based work uh, the contemplative part uh, because social presencing theater itself uh, is emerging from arvana's work as a acharya with uh, shambhala institute so the mindfulness aspect uh, is very important Uh, when you enter a role because we have practiced uh, open heart contemplation and meditation we are doing every day um, we do it in silence and you're tuning in it so you you're tuning fully into whatever it feels like from the inside and giving it a expression what the shape wants to say so for example i may say that uh, the people who are isolated children who are isolated uh have uh, are feeling very difficult and then i may i may try to create a shape and i'm doing it right now alive that how i'm feeling locked in and then i tune into my body into my back my legs and my stomach and then i say a sentence from there whatever comes up my stomach 
wants to breathe. I'm going to tune into that. Power lies within. So just this little demonstration has transformed my feeling of feeling locked down to, to expanding out. And so just giving an example that these kind of contemplative practices when applied into the situation gives us an agency to truly feel what's happening in the field. Uh, and one more thing I want to say, I think Eva uh, kind of reminded me, this is a little um, mystical aspect of the work. Uh, and I think all conflict work. We are invited to those places. Uh, this is to the facilitators also. We are invited to those places of conflict because it's a blessing. Because something wounded wants to heal within me and, and through me. And, and that requires surrendering. And in this moment, I will tell you when in the night, we, there's, the stories were so painful, so painful of what... Uh, people are experiencing in anti-trafficking that I, I cried. I'm, I'm still getting that. Uh, I, I cried uh, and I didn't know what to do. And that night, next morning, I had to then do this, uh, what we call 4D mapping. It's similar to Constellation. And I was like, how, how will I hold that? How will I hold that space? And I just remembered somehow uh, that was the day uh, of uh, Navratri. Navratri is the worship of goddess uh, in India, nine days. And that's, that particular night was the seventh night, which is Kali. We worship the Kali, the ferocious, irrational feminine energy. And I said, okay, there are all kind of people in the room. But for my own self, I just said, you have to find your whatever grounding you need. And I touched the floor and I said, uh, you know, mother, wherever you are and whatever you are, I need you because this is about you. This is about dignity. That was that word was coming to me again and again. This is about dignity. So let's see. And first thing that came and I said, what are the roles which do not have body and need to be in the room? One woman says dignity. And I was like, oh, my God. So you know that you are tuned in the field. And that's when um, that allows you to hold there was another occasion uh, um, where we were doing a map, a resolution around uh, child rape uh, situation. The moment that case came, uh, my back was shivering. And, uh, and, and I looked into it, and these were lawyers and judges and police officers. Uh, I worked with the legal community too, who really want to change the system. And there were people on either sides, on the on the a victim side and on the um, accused side and we wanted to explore what it really means although narrative is so there is structural violence right narrative is fixed if this happens we all hate uh, that guy and that guy needs to get uh, the justice what you know says so what is justice predefined in this case although the person who brought this was saying uh, the healing has not happened the the parents of the child are still wounded in spite of the justice uh, this is a famous case happened in Hyderabad, uh, not Hyderabad, yeah, there was a following case that happened in Hyderabad and there was one happened before that where, um, where the government took strong action and gave death sentence. So now you're dealing with that and I was like, why I am in this? <laughs> you know, why, why I have invited myself? And there the contemplation, I asked everyone to sit in a circle and sit and then something happened and I said, whatever spiritual practice you have, bring it next five minutes. Because I alone cannot handle this. We have to make a choice. We can walk away from here and not talk about it the way we have done for the rest of our life. Or we can get use. I will bring everything that I know. But I want you to bring everything that you have to decide not to leave this room till we feel complete. And, and, and that, was, uh, that was amazing. And that shifted because... There was so much of uh, heartbreak in that room and people held it. So you're not doing it. People are doing it and the field listens to you. You're surrendering. That's the surrendering. The field listens to you. It allows what needs to happen. 
it allows that and i could see the shift in the lawyer who who was on the side of the who was helping the families of the victim he 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 was in the in the theater he was in front of uh, the family of the accused and he felt i am seeing a mirror they are as wounded as me and that led to a resonance that uh, how our system is not working with the family of the accused uh, it's actually it, it came out later on a video and stuff like that there is whole energy shifted so here what happens in the systems conflict the because of our compassion and contemplative practice the light of attention shifts to the blind spots and however difficult it is to handle that uh, that you just see it's there now <laughs> it's there and because our heart is expanded you cannot deny it like go away you are lying uh, but it's there and slowly it finds its way in to me that's the definition of healing right a part of my heart the collective heart is being seen it's broken it's wounded it's crying and and we are seeing that and we are helpless in the moment <laughs> uh, i have i have become a fan of not going to solutions now <laughs> like i am a corporate trained right i was looking so what do we do now because i feel that um, and that's uh, in in another example like this very young man uh, from uh, an a gang crime he he said something beautiful and he said maybe we need to grieve before we move anywhere else and and at least we need tears for our social field to be fertile for anything else to grow so so that's the process actually uh, i trust that he this so many of these fields will slowly connect slowly people will um, find new insight yeah i'm going on and on <laughs> no that's that's amazing i think we are we are getting uh, close to the to the end so i don't know if if you have any any questions still now but uh, or or manish if you want to add something before we start to wrap up i'll wait for your question if any <laughs> oh yeah hundreds and none uh <laughs> I guess one of the what so 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 something that was around for me was feeling it was kind of trying to imagine similar processes happening here and of course you know this isn't my field and I don't work in it but I'm wondering in a in a a, a society like in the UK which kind of prides itself on being secular and where there's much less space I think for or much less shared agreement that that inner space is is so important is kind of you know an integral part of any kind of whole system i i wonder if, whether you've any any experience of doing this sort of similar things in the west or um uh yeah just when, whether you have any reflections on that on that kind of you know to the extent to which a, a kind of cultural Uh, acceptance that that inner contemplative um, part of us should be an important part of of, of anything that we do. Um, yeah, what 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 role that plays? And sorry if that's just a really massive question. <laughs> no, no, thank you for that uh, asking that, and uh, I will be uh, brief. Um, one that uh, yes there are many examples of uh, me and many other people i mean it's a large community and uh, all the related practices including constellation um, they are uh, all happening in different parts of the world and i have worked um, in different parts um, a lot in europe um, and us and then some parts of africa ethiopia um, i feel that um, uh, when we come down to the body and i think the body human body is archetypal our shapes are ar archetypal if i make a shape like this you know in your body what i mean <laughs> oh. it doesn't require so i think that uh, that part uh, happens uh, when people are too much in the head uh, like especially in organizations uh, it's difficult but the more i'm trusting it the more i'm being surprised like with the un system 
uh, we did a map and the f- first moment uh, the chief is on the floor uh, that's her expression of the embodiment and then others say what well, now what do we do and they also embody themselves so i think there is a uh, there is it, it is unlayering it is unarmoring actually there is a childness which knows the language of the body and language of the art and pure expression you know it's there is innocence and beauty uh, so that's the f- one part of the question that i i have hope uh, that it can it works everywhere the second part of the question is about this uh, democracy and um, i think that's a uh, ouch for me because uh, and also invitation so that's a inner conflict which is now an invitation it's a crack and that's when i'm seeing in my country and worldwide the question of nationality and the national identity uh you know that just before covid uh, we were in that space of uh, se- some old shadow of humanity is activated globally we are seeing that america russia uh, britain uh and uh and now and india and so many parts that we are going back into this strong national identity and uh, religious identity racial identity and that kind of um was making me numb actually i was going to a sense of uh, going back to my avoidance <laughs> pattern and i'm wondering what would be a way to bring communities at that scale together into a contemplative social art experience so far my work has happened through invitation now i have to host the space to invite and i i a part of me is thinking <laughs> but other part of me is saying that if not we who uh if we don't uh, open that space because there is so much of um, wound there i realize that woundedness of the communal rights in india is not just 1947 independence it goes back 1000 years so so then uh, that uh, how do we heal that and to which i am my new project that i am starting is uh, i'm uh, i have a blog called sacred well that came in as a dream that a well where community gathers to bring together and heal uh so i'm now hoping to use that as a space to invite people to drink together and dance together and embody together create poetry together and just revisit what is that deep woundedness that's so deeply layered but gets activated and used by few in power that sense of insecurity that immediately puts us into i versus you uh, othering you know that i am hindu they are bad i am indian they are bad i am american others are bad so that narrative that uh, and it's like a new wall i am up against you know all that you do the moment that gets activated even the most intelligent people are suddenly gone into their shells into their caves uh, and Uh, and you're dealing with conflict only at a logical level uh, on twitter and facebook um, that's a binary code that won't serve <laughs> we need to go beyond so that's where i am yeah. on that so <laughs> thank you so much i'm well i'm feeling challenged to wrap up so i'm going to just like say some of the pearls and of the things that stayed with me from this beautiful beautiful amazing conversation So what one I think we started off with like really shifting the way we look into conflict as a blessing as a gift as a as something in the system either of a relationship or within us this calling for attention to be noticed right. another thing that came that was actually came now in the end but I think is somehow intertwined with that is this sense of on one side of surrender of of trusting deep trust and of not uh of of losing the the safe ground of predictability or of resolution and to just be there and trust that as soon as either you or a system becomes aware of of what is not noticed and then becomes noticed then shifts will come you don't have to you know plan design manicure them you ha- just have to trust and that's like really a, a fundamental shift in the way we understand these dynamics and there was so many other things but i kind of st- 
stayed with this need for bringing those aspects that are invisible, that are inner, either to a person, ex personal experience or to the collective experience, bring them uh, together with the materiality of it, with the physical aspects and try to understand that they interplay and that are two sides of the same thing and not like separate things. And just as facilitators and the people who are trying to hold spaces of change, just uh, also surrender to that you're not under un control and tune in to what is feels more real for you in holding a space and trusting and inviting people to be authentic and to be real. And I think in the particular moments we live in, that's what we've been called to do, to be real and to be honest and to kind of dissolute ourselves in, in you know, in what, this whole moment of history is inviting us to stay with the not knowing and, and trust that things will unfold in a way that maybe is more life-affirming. I don't know, Eva, would you like to add something, Manish, uh, as we close? Uh, well, I'm just left with the, the, the beautiful um, intention that you expressed right at the end there of, of just opening a space for that kind of deep cultural and historical healing that I feel is, you know, becoming the, the need for it to, is becoming more and more obvious every single day. Um, and I'm really excited to, to uh, go and visit the well and, and see more of what, of what you're offering there because I, yeah, I just really, uh, really, really resonate with that. Really lovely. Manish, I think you told me you had you had a poem you'd like to share. Do you still do you still want to do it, or shall we close here? Um, I'm just thinking. <laughs> I know we are uh, at the end of our time. Maybe I I was planning of another poem, but now this moment kind of invites for this, uh, this one. Uh, and, uh, and I would just, uh, before that, I want to just say thank you to you. Uh, this, uh, these conversations are, uh, I'm, I learned a lot. Uh, how, because you helped me uh, make visible my own story in a way. I was able to weave and see it myself. And you are such gracious listeners. Uh, that you and your questions were so beautiful. So thank you so much for for hosting me and for giving me this beautiful space to meet my own self. And Eva, when you played back that intention, I felt something went down in me. It is like, oh my God, I have to do that now. You know. So <laughs> so, so I, thank, you. <laughs> thank you so much. And I will just read this poem as a wish for the world, right? I will read the title in the end. So it, uh, because that's the last one anyways. Let's, let's read this together. A compelling need to be right sometimes comes to compensate years of being wronged. A compelling right to prove our pride sometimes comes to cover up Years of shame for losing the same. A compelling desire to assert our identity sometimes comes to reclaim many lifetimes lived or lost in shadow. Do we really need to walk all the way back in our long faded complex history to undo those wrongdoings? Can we sleep tonight and wake up in a field where past became a white butterfly? Thank you. Namaste, Manish. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>